rise if you're able. And follow me in the word of call to worship. God is here in this sanctuary. Enter this time of worship with a joyful expectation. We will praise you, O oh God, and not be silent. We will give thanks to you.
looks like a bunch of different shells. But I don't know the names of all these shells. What, what do they call that? You know? It's like a conch shell or something. Look, you can see that there's another shell that gets stuck inside that shell. You see it down in there? I tried to get it out, but you can't do it. I have a really rough shell. And then I have a brown shell. I always like these because they have a nice color to them. like those. And then I had a couple of them, like real light weight ones. So you find all these things where? Where do you think I must have gone? I must have gone to the beach at some time and picked these things up. Isn't that weird? And then one day I opened the box and they're all there again. I don't know where, why I thought I would, would uh, put them in a box and hide them somewhere. But I did just that. So have you uh, ever gone to Christmas Run Park where we're going to have a picnic? Uh, did you ever go in the stream there? There's like a stream. That's pretty cool, isn't it? To run in a stream and kind of play in there. Did you did you find anything unexpected in that water? Anything? A very pokey rock. Okay. That's not good when you don't have shoes on, is it? <laughs> that hurts when you step on a rock. Oh, that's not good. So today in our story, uh, it's a story about a general about a man in the military in another country uh, near Israel uh, who uh, needed to go down into a river to be healed of a skin disease that he had. And uh, he didn't want to go down into the water because this particular river, you couldn't see anything in it. You ever been someplace where it's just like all mud and you can't see down in it? It'd be kind of scary to put your foot in that one. Yeah? You, you're pretty brave about you. Uh, maybe you know there's something in there. Okay. So sometimes, in order for us to, to get good things or to do good things, we have to do hard things. Sometimes we don't know what's in the water, but we still have to go in. And that's a big symbol for our church, because that's why we have that baptismal fund. That people, we dip people down in the water because we're passing through into a new, new part of our life. And new things happen, and we have to walk ahead in faith and do the right things. So uh, today, uh, we have a story of Naaman, and uh, it's going to be a, a neat story about this guy who had faith and he was healed. So before we leave, let's say a word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for uh, Julie and uh, for the fine enjoyment of life uh, that she has and all the wonderful mysteries of summer that come upon us. So thank you for all those experiences for the way you bring to us loving family and a church family. And we pray that you watch over Julie this summer, help her to have a wonderful time, continue to surround her with your light and your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks for coming up and being brave. reading this morning is from 2 Kings verses, uh, chapter 5 verses 1 through 17 and it's taken from the contemporary English version. <coughs> Naaman was the commander of the Syrian army. The Lord had helped him and his troops defeat their enemies. So the king of Syria respected Naaman very much. Naaman was a brave soldier but he had leprosy. One day, while the Syrian troops were raiding Israel, they captured a girl and she became a servant of Naaman's wife. Sometime later, the girl said, If your husband Naaman would go to the prophet in Samaria, he would be cured of his leprosy. When Naaman told the king what the girl had said, the king replied, Go ahead, I will give you a letter to take to the king of Israel. Naaman left, took along 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 new outfits. He also carried the letter to the king of Israel. It said, I am sending my servant Naaman to you. Would you cure him of his leprosy? When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in fear and shouted, that Syrian king believes I can cure this man of leprosy. Does he 
and an arrogant spirit before a fall. An arrogant spirit. Our failure to listen to the wisdom of other people and to accept the help that other people could give us if we weren't so prideful. Bob Dylan has a great line in one of the songs. He, he produced some great Christian music in the late 70s and the early 80s. Some of the best. And he's got this line in one of the songs. How long can you hate yourself for the weakness you conceal? Do you want people to know your weakness? The truth is that we all suffer unnecessarily because often we don't want people to see or to know about our weaknesses. Because I think in part we live in such a competitive society that we often don't see the side of life that needs to be cooperative and to support and care for one another. Think about how difficult it is for us when we have medical conditions. Many employees hide medical details from employers because they believe it can be used against them. Isolation doesn't feel good. How do you feel when you go into a doctor's office and you see someone you know? You think, oh no, here's so and so, and now they're going to know that I'm coming to this doctor. There's a certain stigma for many different kinds of illnesses and we don't want people to know our personal business. There's a whole field of study around this um, cooperative versus competitive lifestyle. So in our culture, we value the self-made individual. But we need to remember that that's a lie. Not one of us is self-made. Not one of us is self-sufficient. And every day, in many ways, we depend on others for our well-being. Now, that could be a mindfulness exercise if you want to take something home today. Think about all of the things that have enhanced your life that other people have provided. We actually are living in the grace of others who contributed to our well-being out of a sense of the common good. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Naaman didn't like this idea of admitting that he needed help from anybody else. Do you know somebody like that? Especially not from the people that he himself had humiliated and conquered and was better than the Israelites. So this individualism is a serious problem that causes a great deal of isolation among us all. And our culture is just fascinated by failures. And every day in the news is a new failure of an athlete or a failure of a famous celebrity or the failure of a politician. And somehow we believe that we can't have winners if we don't have losers. And Naaman is a winner in a very tough doggy dog world. And he's afraid that he will become one of the losers, like the people of Israel, who lost the war to him. Think of the power of that word. Loser. With the shape of an L on your forehead. For those of you who know what that means. If you listen to Smash now, you'll know what that means. So God and God's prophet Elisha gracefully see things differently. And they know that Naaman is also a person who has weaknesses and has needs. And that's the gospel. 
Come just as you are. Because, yeah, you have strength. But come just as you are because you also have weakness. And you need a place to be accepted as a full human being. A place where you can be honest about the things that you do. I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you have ever resisted going to the doctor? stories, right? Well, I think it'll get better. Well, it's not so bad. I think I'll just wait a little bit. I'm sure you don't have those conversations when you're here at home. But I want you to look at these stories of Scripture as a real deal. This is the real life stuff here. And this is a, a wonderful story which has many characters in it. It has people who are weak and people who in the eyes of the world are strong and it inverts it. Because the people who come out to be the heroes are the people who this world considers to be weak. And the people who come out weak are the people that this world considers to be strong. And that's the gospel. There's a servant girl. There are slaves that are forced to go with Naaman into this foreign land. There's a very eccentric prophet and shaman called Elisha. Matter of fact, this is the third uh, Sunday that we've had Elisha stories. There were two kings, not three, one of a foreign land and one of Israel. And where do you go when you need help? You go to the person you think is the most powerful person, right? You go to the king. And what does the king do? He goes to the other person that he feels is most powerful, the other king. Now, some people have suggested that the stories of the birth of Jesus with the Magi going and asking Herod where to find uh, the birth of baby Jesus was a parody on this story about Eli Elisha. And that these two kings who don't know what the story is are like the kings in Jesus' day who don't know what the story is. And where they should have been going was on the street. And they should have asked people on the street where they find Jesus. Because only on the street do you find humility. And you realize that the value of humility is found because you've been broken. And not because you're strong. So Naaman, Martin when it was like to have a chronic illness. Whenever I read stories like this, I think, what in the world were they doing back then? Did you think that when you heard that about, you know, going down in the water and dipping seven times? There's a lot of strange stuff that we don't understand in the Old Testament. We don't understand why they thought that people could be healed in certain ways. But when you think about it, there is this whole uh, Native American healer, healer shamanic uh, world where people of that era, the only people who could ever possibly heal you are the people who could pray for you. The people who can intercede with God on your behalf. And so Elisha sets about this business of being the healer in Israel. And it's at least five times that Elisha heals people in this whole narrative. With a wide array of strange rituals. So you can't blame Naaman for not wanting to follow through with these things. You have to imagine that what if you came to this hut in the middle of the wilderness and some guy told you to go down in the muddy water to the Jordan River and dip yourself seven times. Now the only thing that saved Naaman and the only way that he was able to be healed of his leprosy, which is a terrible disease by the way, it had no cure in that day. It was slowly overtook you. It was debilitating because your muscles actually atrophy. It's also painful. And what does it do for you socially? In Jesus' day, if you had leprosy, you couldn't be around anybody because everybody was afraid that they might get it. So here's a person who is isolated socially. And he thought that he was well off. He was a wealthy person. 
He was a leader of his people. He was intelligent. And no matter how good he was, some bad things still happened to him. I know a lot of people that when something bad happens to them, they come and ask me, what did I do wrong? And so one of the most important things that we can hear is, it'll be okay, you didn't do anything wrong. Even in your illness, it'll be okay. Because God is good. We don't have to be in control of everything. Like man. We don't have to find our way and judge ourselves because we went to the wrong doctor. Or we didn't have the proper medical advice for a loved one at a time when we needed it and we lost them. We all have a lot of regrets about health and healing and death and weakness our infirmities. But I want you to imagine this king, I don't even remember everything that he brought with him. Seems to me I wouldn't go across the desert with all the things they got here. 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 new outfits. Now what did he need 10 new outfits for when he's in the middle of the desert? He can do it because he can pack heavy. He's wealthy. He can do whatever he wants, right? And he brings all these things because he thinks he's going to solve this problem by picking somebody off the him. So finally, it's not the king of Israel that has the power. It's never the king. It's never the president that has the power. Power is always in the people. So Naaman goes out to this shack in the middle of nowhere. Now, I've participated in Native American sweat lodges, okay? I don't recommend it. <laughs> but I can, tell you what, I can tell you what they look like. They have these big boughs that they bend over, all in these different shapes, and they tie them together, and they throw animal skins over it, and they make it really hot in that place. So my imagination, I imagine this little Native American sweat lodge out in the middle of the desert with this little guy named Elisha who is the weakest and the least important person. And so this guy pulls up and he's got these garments. What good are they to this guy? What good are the piles of silver to this guy? That's not why he's going to heal people. It reminds me of the story in Gandhi where the British officers go way out to Gandhi's humble shack in India and they can't bribe him. They don't know how to motivate him. Because he has a different power. He has a true power. And we realize who the true powers that we are. So it's uh, understandable that Naaman would say, I wonder if I should just turn around and go home at this point. He had to be disappointed because this was completely outside of the realm of his possibility. This is likely another spiritual test that a spiritual leader is throwing at someone to see if they'll follow through or not. So, what does he say? He says, go wash in the Jordan River. And Naaman almost leaves, right? He's got a decision point. But the people who keep him there are his slaves. Because his slaves know the street. And his slaves know that a guy like this, he knows what he's talking about. But for Naomi, Naomi, it was all about him. He must have thought that there'd be a big military parade and everyone would notice how shiny his skin was when he got healed. And he would have this great entry where he presented all these gifts to a wonderful prophet. And here he is in the middle of the desert in a sweat lodge having to dip in the Jordan River. Why, why does he do it? Desperation. So much desperation that he's broken. He's at the end. This is the only chance he's got. He's got to go to this guy. So I want you today to know that nations and people need to be aware that there is such a thing as too much pride. Because when we are too prideful, we fail to understand that we can learn from other people and nations. We fail to reach out to allies and depend on people who also extend care to us. 
And when we emphasize the importance of our own needs and discredit the needs of others, Naaman's healing was a result of a whole lot of people along the way. Think about it when you had a family member that was sick. Think about all the people that you're grateful for. The neighbor, a friend that took you to an appointment. You know how it is when you have a serious illness. You need a lot of support staff in order to make it through that moment. But we live in the same world, the same world of status and power, and we think that's where it's at. Naaman and Elisha. A world where you know need to know who's better than you and who's lesser than you so that you know how to treat them with respect or with contempt. And we need to say to people, it'll be okay. Even in illness, even in your moments when your weakness is revealed, even when you admit that maybe you could do things a little differently, it will be okay. Because God is good. Do you ever really see other people as they really are? Do you ever really see a person in their fullness, in their strength, and in their weakness. We live in a world of status and power. People of the Spirit always teach humility, equality, and equanimity. And we have a spiritual conversion and a healing, and that is real power. When you see people as they really are. Not that that person is there for your gain or your loss. Not for what that other person might be able to do for you. But because in that relationship you are stronger and you can share together. Elisha was testing Naaman. Maybe God tests us every once in a while by putting people in our life and in our way that we might judge poorly. This is the dynamic of the soul. And maybe Naaman was healed because Elisha was the only person who could look beyond Naaman's position and his place and his wealth and yet even his leprosy and provide salvation and understanding. So sometimes when people come in and they have a problem, I say, check your head. And our whole life is a process of weeding out the thoughts that are good and the thoughts that aren't so good for us. And when we have those thoughts, we have to ask ourselves if pride has gotten in our way. So today, teach humility, embrace equality, and reach out to others in a moment of weakness. Amen.
our tithes and our offerings so that the congregation and the church as a whole and even the community can benefit from us. Let us give.
Please be seated. As we gather around this table, we want to remind you that we practice open communion. We not only invite you, but we also encourage you to share with us in this meal as uh, it's a sign of God's grace to us. And we say the gifts of God for the people of God. And we recognize at this table the great thanksgiving for all that we've been given. And we commit ourselves as disciples of Jesus. We uh, also offer alternative bread, uh, which is uh, gluten-free and uh, there's a description in the bulletin. And our special usher uh, will be available if you'd like to uh, signal him uh, when that time comes. But we invite you to join with us at this table as we join together in the litany for the sacrament of Holy Communion printed in your bulletin. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give thanks and praise to our Creator. Let us pray. God of every good gift, the church itself is one of your greatest miracles. You welcome us to come just as we are. We witness a long line of pastors, teachers, healers, builders, and missionaries who do your will by ministering to the needs of people throughout the world. We who gather at your table pledge our loyalty to your word. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts and on us. Amen. We remember that when Jesus was at table with the disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, the cup of salvation, and he gave it to his apostles and disciples, saying, this is the new covenant. Take, drink all of it, and remember me. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. People come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and they gather about this table of the Lord. So now we invite you to come and see how good and pleasant it is when people live together in peace. Come for all things are not. 